certainly good to see each one. We have a number of visitors here in the room, and I know that we have a number who are watching online and will watch at a later time. We certainly appreciate the work that Aaron Cozord and Aaron Gallagher do, the works that they do. We're privileged today to be able to have Aaron Cozort with us. Uh, Brother Gallagher will be uh, with us the first hour tomorrow morning. Aaron Cozort is a good friend of the school. He's a good friend to the students, the students who have had the opportunity uh, to get to know him. He preaches at the Collierville Church of Christ. In fact, a couple of our students actually work with him uh, there at Collierville. He is married to Eddie. They have three children, James, Isaiah, and Micah. Aaron is a 2008 graduate of the Tri-Cities School of Preaching. Uh, that's in Elizabethton, in Elizabethton, Tennessee. He has worked in the past with the Gospel Broadcasting Network for five years. He uh, is, I guess, the one who started Truth.fm. A great work, and uh, I'm sure he will mention that. Uh, I know that there's some materials for those that are present uh, here in the room and others. If you're watching at home and you want more information about that, uh, he will probably tell you how you can find out more information. But we are glad that Brother Aaron is with us in this area, the area of technology. Uh, we would be hard-pressed to find um, many if any, who, who could do a better job than Eric Cozort. So give him your full attention today. you got to press all the requisite buttons. Thank you for that introduction, Daniel. Uh, it is always good to be with you. I appreciate your time, and I intend to do my best to provide you as much value as I possibly can in the time that we have. We're going to go through a number of things throughout this period of study in the next two days, and for those who can't be here the entire time, uh, it will be streamed. Uh, obviously, the students, you, you will be expected to be here, but for those who are with us who are, who are not full-time students, um, it will be streamed and it will be archived on the msop.org slash seminars page. So I encourage you to, to go there if there are sessions that you cannot make it to. Uh, look forward to Aaron Gallagher joining us tomorrow morning for the 9 a.m. session. Uh, one of the things that I have learned in technology is that you can't know everything. You can't know how to do everything. You can spend your whole life working in technology and you'll find out the longer you spend in it, the less you know, because technology moves faster than, than most of us can learn. So what I have spent the majority of my time and my career doing is solving problems. Uh, I, I don't really consider myself to be a technology professional. I consider myself to be a troubleshooter. And so the majority of my five years at GBN, I spent solving problems. Management would come to me and say, we want to do X. How do we do it? Well, that's just a problem. That's just a problem to be solved. But much is the same way with Scripture. When you're studying Scripture and you look at a passage, you go, what does this mean? The way my brain works, that's just a problem to be solved. It's just a troubleshooting process. Well, what's the context say? How do we use the context? How do we use it properly? How do we work from that context to work forward to a definition of, of words and, and then definitions in those contexts and then the verses before it, verses after it, chapters before it, chapters after it, the entire book and ultimately the scope of the Bible. As you think concerning any issue that you face as a student, as an elder, as a deacon, as a member, as a preacher, as a minister, as you face issues and problems and questions about what you should and shouldn't do, 
always address it first and foremost with, what would God have me do? Take your Bibles, if you will, and open them to Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to begin here because this is critical. In everything that we do, we don't want to be determining the direction to go. We want to be walking, as it were, in the footsteps of Jesus. Proverbs chapter 3, Proverbs writer, as he begins his discussion of these wise sayings with his son, who it is primarily addressed to, and seeking to provide that wisdom to him, says this, beginning in verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. That is a call for us to think concerning what we're doing, but not to rest upon the scope of our limited understanding, the scope of our limited knowledge. God expects us to look beyond what we already know. That's why you're a student here. If you had decided that it was enough wisdom that you had that before you ever came to school, you had enough wisdom, you just didn't need time in school, you didn't need to be a student, you didn't need to learn, you wouldn't be here. You recognize you need to grow, you need to develop, and that's what my life in my career has been, is one opportunity to develop after another. One of the pieces of advice that I got from the director of the Tri-City School of Preaching was this. He would look at us and Wesley Simons would say, if you're given an opportunity, especially early on in your preaching career, take it. If you're given an opportunity to speak on a radio program, take it. If you're given an opportunity to teach on a television program, take it. If you're given an opportunity to do a Bible study, take it. He didn't encourage us to neglect our families, and that's always important. We need to keep things in proportion and in, our, in the correct context. But what he wanted us to realize is don't shy away from opportunities. And the value proposition of that is every opportunity you take, every task you overcome, and even the things you fail at will help you learn to be better. One of the things that I've learned by being a troubleshooter when it comes to technology is that I fail more than I succeed. But that's okay because every time I fail, I learn something. If someone asks me, how do you do X, Y, Z, I don't begin by already knowing the answer. I begin by testing the answer. I've got an idea of how it might work. I can go read and research how it might work, but you have to test the answer. You have to do trials. You have to think about the process and develop a process. One of the things that I'm going to teach you through the course of the next two days is a process I've developed. Uh, I have been building websites for churches for 15 years. Uh, I started building my first websites uh, that, that weren't for churches but for uh, a bookstore that my dad had when I was a teenager. I've been doing it for a long time. I started off in the days of Microsoft Front Page. There is someone in the room who knows that terrible program. Uh, that's where I started. It was, it was terrible. And then I moved to Dreamweaver, and then I started doing some hand coding. I am not going to teach you HTML. I am not going to teach you to hand code web pages. I am not going to teach you code at all. There's a better way to do things. Um, and so what I have been developing over the last 15 years is a process whereby I can help congregations get a website online, but I've come to this realization. There's no way I can build enough congregations to make a dent in what the church needs to do by way of making an impact in the world. And so I don't have enough time to do it by myself, therefore I have to teach others to do it as well. You don't have enough time to teach everyone who needs to hear the gospel. But turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul writes to Timothy, and as he writes to this young preacher, he gives him an admonition that I, I bet you all have heard before. Actually, 2 Timothy chapter 2, I got the wrong one. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, he says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. In that vein, here's what I want you to know about everything that I teach when it comes to technology. I don't claim any ownership to it or proprietary ownership in any way, shape, or form. Take it, and as long as you are serving the Lord, use it and preferably teach someone else how to do it as well. Um, we all strive to do things that provide for our families and, and take care of the physical necessities of this life, but the reality is we've got a bigger goal. That's why this particular session is called Facing the Competition. Facing the competition, because the reality is someone else is out there using the internet too. And that someone is the devil. Satan is using the internet, and he's using it far better than we are. He's developed his skills utilizing his servants far more than we have. And it's about time that we start training ourselves to go to battle. We need to be able to be sound in doctrine. We need to be able to go to battle on doctrinal fronts, but we need to be able to go to battle on communication fronts as well. And that's the only part of technology I really care about. The kind of technology that communicates with people that influences people because that's how we reach them with the gospel. Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, that we were to take the gospel to every creature. That we are to go out and make disciples, Matthew chapter 28. That we are to be those who preach repentance and remission of sins to every nation, Luke chapter 24. And he said that was going to begin in Jerusalem and then to Judea, and then to Samaria, and then to the uttermost part of the earth, Acts chapter 1. And you and I, and every Christian alive today, is responsible for that commission. And so the technology that I care about, the technology that I will encourage you to learn, and the technology and the steps and the tasks that I will encourage you to tackle will be things that matter for teaching people. You may say, I am, I am a Luddite. Raise your hand if you don't know what Luddite means. I don't understand technology. You say, I don't understand technology. I don't use technology. I don't like technology. I refuse. That's great, and that's perfectly fine. You better be out talking to people in person. You better be knocking doors, and you better be using every means you have that doesn't include technology to reach the lost. Technology is not the only way. It is not even the primary way. But we need to be involved in every way as the church universally. We need to be involved in every opportunity that the church has to teach the lost because it's the reason we're here. It's what we are to be about. It is what we are to do. Go back to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3 he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. But he follows that up with this, in all your ways, acknowledge him. You will be tempted in this life as a preacher, as a leader, to see individuals looking up to you and think it's about you. It's not. Some of the greatest men I know, some of the greatest preachers I know, they know this. It's not about them. Their job is to get out of the way of the message. True or false, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, Paul is the power of God unto salvation. False. Eric knows. I will wait for an answer. True or false? 
The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. To who? To everyone that believeth, beginning with who? The Jews. And then to who? The Greeks. We understand that includes everybody, Jew and non-Jew. The gospel begins with obedience, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The gospel ends with obedience, Romans chapter 16. The gospel is faith and obedience. And when we recognize that the message that we have to proclaim will save people's souls, we can make sure that it's not about us, it's about the message. You may have opportunities to do things that puts you in front of a lot of people. You may have opportunities to do things that encourages people to listen to you. You may have opportunities in your life that provide you well financially to teach people. But here's what you need to remember. You better remember who it all belongs to. And you better give back more than you ever get. And if you can't, you better try as hard as you can. Because you can't outgive God. And you can't outdo God. But you certainly ought to try. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And as he closed 2 Corinthians, he wrote to them and he said that he would gladly spend and be spent on their behalf. And do you know what he also said in that passage? He also said that the more he loved them, the less love he got in return. Paul didn't say, I will spend and be spent, I will work and I will labor for those who do good to me in return. He said, I will spend and be spent for you, for the benefit of your soul, no matter what you do in return. And we need preachers today who do not care what they get back from someone else. They care about what that soul hears. And we need to make sure that's our message. Back to facing the competition. Satan is using the internet. Raise your hand if you know that sin is a problem on the internet. Okay, we're in complete agreement on that one. We all recognize that sin is far more pervasive in this world than righteousness. And brethren, that's always going to be true. True or false, Jesus said that the wide way and the broad way would be filled with those doing righteousness and many there would be who find it. False. The world is is engaged in a battle, though. I want to tell you something that you may not know about the Internet. article came out in Wired Magazine a few years ago, I think 2015. And it was an article about the people who clean the Internet. Believe it or not, as of 2015, there was a large section of jobs, both overseas and even some in the U.S., where people were responsible for checking feeds in social media. The computer algorithms would flag items as potentially uh, against terms of service, and these people's jobs were to sit and to validate whether or not the alert about the terms of service was accurate. But the article was written to inform people that the ratio of individuals doing this job who were suffering mental illness and some large portion who were committing suicide was a substantial problem. Because their responsibility was to scrub the internet of things like 
terrorist activities that were being uploaded to social media. People being beheaded and killed and mutilated, raped and abused. And it was their job to make sure that you as a consumer never saw it. We don't realize the scope of the evil that's on the internet, I think, in this country. We have a lot of filters in this country. We have a lot of laws in this country. But the reality is the internet is filled with evil. Does that mean we should avoid it? Does that mean that we should not go anywhere near it, shouldn't use it? Well, that would be like saying there's a lot of evil going on in a city, therefore we should preach the gospel there. You know there was a preacher who actually believed that, right? His name was Jonah. Jonah was called by God to go to Tarshish to teach a people who he didn't like. He didn't want them to be saved. He didn't want them to be redeemed. He didn't want them to repent. He didn't want to go to them and preach God's message because he knew that if they heard it and they repented, God would relent and wouldn't destroy them. You know, that same people, about 150 years later, God used to wipe Israel, northern kingdom of Israel, off the face of the map. Because while Tarshish would hear, I keep saying Tarshish, I've got the wrong city. What's the right city? Somebody tell me. Tarshish is where he fled to. Nineveh, thank you, sorry. It, while Nineveh would hear and repent, the northern kingdom of Israel didn't. We need to be those who are taking the battle of the gospel against Satan everywhere Satan goes. But we also need to be warned because there is wisdom about what we should and shouldn't do. There is wisdom about how we should and shouldn't handle ourselves. Let's begin in Proverbs chapter 5. Before we start talking about all the things that we should do on the internet, let's talk about a few of the things we shouldn't do. Let's talk about being aware of Satan's darts that can pierce us. Let's talk about making sure that we're first being righteous before we try and save someone who's not righteous. Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1, My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding that you may preserve discretion and your lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, in the end her, she is, as, is bitter as wormwood, excuse me, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path of life, her ways are unstable, you do not know them. And then verse 8, remove your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. Brethren, there's things we should not be doing online. But that's a challenge. Everyone who's grown up in the age of the internet knows that's a challenge. Because you get introduced to it when you don't even have any control over it. And you get introduced to it in places that you didn't even think would be a problem. But here's the reality. You do not prepare yourself to deal with sin by only avoiding it. You want to know how I know? Because you can't avoid sin forever. At some point, you have to be prepared to say no. One of the things that I did when I was a teenager is I took martial arts. One of the things that my sensei taught us through a process we called spirit drills was how to be prepared to be punched. This was a fun process. It was wonderfully fun. We, we did martial arts in a, in a basketball gym. 
So here was the process. As I was about 13 years old, maybe 12 years old, my middle brother, some of you know my middle brother, Nathan, he is bigger than I am, and he likes hurting people. I, I mean, it, all in good fun, but it, it's, 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 it, physical exertion is a joy for him. So the responsibility of the students in the class for martial arts was to do spirit drills. Spirit drills involved one student facing another student, and we would go all the way down the gym floor, and one of us would work on breathing techniques, taking punches, and the other one would work on punching. I am a person of immense size, as you can tell. Do you know what it's like to be punched 25 times going down a gym, and you get to do nothing other than take it? The reality is it's not that bad if you know how to take a punch. I didn't have a, a useful uh, individual for this, but I will tell you a recount to you a story. This is not to pat myself on the back, it's to make a point. A couple of years ago at a Bible camp, I was asked to speak on this subject to teenagers, specifically the dangers of the internet. And I said, how can I illustrate being prepared to deal with sin? And I thought about spirit drills. Just so happens, one of the, uh, uh, one of the counselors at that camp is an ICE agent, and he's a little bigger than I am. Actually, he's a lot bigger than I am. And so I went to him. He's an elder in the church. I asked him, I said, Ken, I need you to do me a favor. When we get up in class this afternoon as we're talking about being prepared to deal with sin, I need you to do something for me. He said, okay, Aaron, what, what do you need? I need you to punch me. He looked at me and he thought, I'm going to break him in half. He said, Aaron, I don't think I can hold back. I said, I didn't ask you to. He said, you know, I, I don't know what your level is. Maybe dial it down to 80%. But here's the thing. What you do is you punch someone in the one place that if you're unprepared for it, you are just doubled over and you can't survive. I mean, you're, you're just done. You're out of the fight. It's called the solar plexus. Has anyone ever been sucker punched in the solar plexus? Raise your hand. Somebody in school has. Yep. All right. What happens? Your breath goes out of you immediately. If you weren't ready for it, if you didn't know how to prepare for it, you're, you're done. But did you know that is the one of the most defensible places to be punched in your entire body? If you know how to breathe. There's a process that you learn in martial arts that allows you to breathe. And when he punched me... now. We, he, he wanted to do a, 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 just a trial run. So the day, the, uh, earlier that day or whatever, it, he said, let, let me, he said, I, I really am afraid I'm going to hurt you. I said, it'll be okay. And so when nobody was around, he, he punched me. And, it, you know, it took fifth, half a second, two seconds, three seconds to go, okay, we're good. It'll be fine during class. I was like, okay. And, I mean, he was worried about it. it, it, it to, be, to be fair, he was really worried about it. So... When we got up in front of the class, I said, now, here's what's going to happen. Ken's going to punch me. And ev every single person there, all, most of the guys are bigger than I am. They're like, nah, it's not going to be real. And then Ken punched me. And I waited about three seconds, and then I went on with my lesson. Because I was prepared for it. Because I knew how to deal with it. When you are prepared for sin... You can deal with sin. Now, we don't prepare ourselves for sin the same way we do spirit drills up and down the gym in martial arts. You don't go and put yourself in front of sin so you can say no all the time. What do you do? It's right here in Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, he says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Number one, if you're going to deal with sin on the internet or anywhere else, you begin by testing your actions against God's word. If you hold your action or the action you're contemplating or the thing that you're being tempted to do or the thing you're being suggested to do up against God's word and it fails the test of righteousness, don't do it. The answer should be no. 
But then go on. He says, in all your ways acknowledge him. Is the thing you're contemplating doing, is the thing you're being tested on, is the thing you're being tempted to do something that brings acknowledgement to God or decreases your acknowledgement of God? But then go on and he shall direct your paths. If you were to consider this contemplation, this action, this thing that you might do, this thing you're tempted to do, and could you imagine Jesus doing it? Because if he can't direct your paths down a path he wouldn't go, then you shouldn't be on the path. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Here's what warning number one. If you want to be able to deal with sin, and if you want to be able to teach others to deal with sin, you have to not be proud. Someone quote me the passage about pride and what it does. What comes after it? Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit for... I knew it was a memory verse. It's a memory verse in every school of preaching. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. What did he just say here? Do not be wise in your own eyes. Two examples of this, where two men who were great men, righteous men, fell into temptation and sinned. Abraham. He's traveling to Gerar because of a famine in the land. He comes to Gerar and he tells them what? She's my sister. Through the course of the event and through the course of the discussion, we learn that he told the lie because he thought there was no fear of the Lord in the land. Key word there. He thought. We don't read, I inquired of the Lord and the Lord told me there was no fear of him in the land. We don't read that at all. He thought there was no fear of the Lord in the land. Then we come forward to his son, Isaac, and Isaac comes to Gerar. And Isaac says what about Rebekah? She's my sister. Somebody asked me just last night, we were discussing this in Bible class at Collierville, someone said, do you think, because Isaac wasn't born when that happened with Sarah, do you think that Abraham told Isaac what he did? I said, I don't know. Maybe Sarah told Isaac what his dad did. I don't know. Maybe there was no connection whatsoever. They both thought of the same lie. I don't know. But again, with Isaac and Rebekah, we find that Isaac, this righteous man, is rebuked because here is a king and a people who recognize guilt that comes with adultery. And they would not have done that. Why? Because the fear of the Lord was still in the land. So what do we read here? Do not be wise in your own eyes. What caused Isaac to sin? His own wisdom. His own understanding of the situation instead of God. What, what caused uh, Abraham to sin? His own wisdom and his own understanding concerning the situation instead of God's. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. There's the last key. The passage doesn't say fear hell. The passage doesn't say fear judgment. The passage says fear the Lord. Honor, reverence. There was a man who was faced with temptation. There was a man who was faced with temptation day in and day out, time in and time out, day after day after day after day. And when he was caught and told, you need to do this, what was his response? How can I commit this sin against my God? Fear the Lord. 
he wasn't nearly as worried about sinning against her or Potiphar as he was sinning against the Lord. Trust in the Lord first, but follow it up with the fear of the Lord. Reverence and awe and respect and decision-making based upon who he is. Now, I have no idea what time it is. 944. We've got about five minutes. Let's talk about how Satan uses the internet and how we can trip ourselves up. Here's one of the big ones. Satan uses the internet to decrease our influence by convincing us that the internet is anonymous. Come on, we all know that we've thought it at one point in time. If you turn on the right settings and if you take the right steps and if you delete the right things, no one will know you did it. I am here as the IT individual to tell you you are blatantly wrong. Because we log everything. We, speaking for the internet community and the technology community, track everything. Your internet service provider go, knows every website you go to. You say, well, that's all right. I use a VPN. That's okay. There's actually nothing wrong with using a VPN. If you know what that is, it's a virtual private network. It secures your data and puts you through a portal and you come out the other side and you're supposedly anonymized. Provided that the company that's providing you the VPN isn't also logging your data. Provided that the company who is providing the VPN, VPN hasn't been told by the US government they have to log your data. And they, by the way, won't reveal that to you. Did you know that in the United States, up until a few years ago, there was a responsibility, a requirement, among all cellular carriers to log all cellular traffic and provide it to the, the United States government? Yes, that's what Edward Snowden revealed to us in 2000, whatever it was. Wait a minute, you're saying I'm not anonymous online? No, you're not anonymous online. The network is built to not be anonymous. But it doesn't really matter if someone else in this life knows what you did. Who does? God and you. You're never anonymous. Because we will all stand before him and be judged, according to the book of Revelation, based upon the deeds that we do in this life, whether good or evil. Anonymity, or the claim of anonymity, is something that Satan uses on the internet. But, let me tell you this, anonymity is also a valuable tool on the internet. There are some countries where teaching the gospel is against the law. Does that mean we should not teach the gospel in those countries? No, it does not mean that at all. There was a time in the land of Israel where it was against the law to teach the truth. Did that keep the disciples or the apostles from teaching the truth? When the council pulled them aside in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5 and said, we instructed you clearly to stop teaching in this name, what did they say? We cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. They also asked the question, is it better to obey God or man? There are tools on the internet, there are tools with technology that can anonymize our information and that might be a valuable tool to teach the gospel in places where it's against the law but 
let me just put a bug in your ear. If you ever decide to become a missionary and go to a land where teaching the gospel is frowned upon or prohibited or against the law, do your research before you go. Because a lot of things that look like they will protect your data won't. There are a lot of softwares out there like Tor and others uh, that they, they might protect some data, but they won't protect you from China. So uh, we, we need to be careful. We need to be observant. We need to pay attention to how, what Satan uses, how he uses it, but we also need to.